Welcome. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me Dr. Clive Svensson. Dr. Svensson is a neuroscientist and stem cell biologist. He did his pre-doctoral training at Harvard University. He received his PhD from the University of Cambridge in England, where he subsequently became a welcome fellow and established a laboratory focusing on stem cell research. He then moved to the University of Wisconsin in 2000 as a professor of neurology and anatomy and founded their Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine Center. In 2010, he moved to Los Angeles and founded the Cedar sinai Board of Governors Regenerative Medicine Institute, which currently has 23 faculty members and over 120 staff. Dr. Svensson is also a member of the Julian Jane Society Science Advisory Board. He has a long-standing interest in Julian Jaynes's theory and began his career looking at post-mortem schizophrenic brain tissue and determining how the left and right hemispheres may drive aspects of the disease. Currently, his work involves transplanting stem cells into the brain and spinal cord of patients with ALS in order to establish how neural transplants may be able to modify neuronal functioning and survival. Welcome, Dr. Svensson. Thank you. Great to be here. So to start off, can you talk a little bit about your research that you're doing right now and some of the things you hope to achieve with that? Yeah, in general, my research involves both treating and modeling neurological diseases like ALS, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's. And the two areas we're working in is transplantation of cells into the brain or the spinal cord to modulate the disease and then actually growing the patient's own cells in the Petri dish to understand more about the disease. So those are the two areas that we're focusing in. That is fascinating research. And how did you first become interested in Julian Jaynes's theory? And also, can you talk a little bit about some of your early research with schizophrenia? So I first became interested in Julian Jaynes through a very good friend of mine, Michael Bird, when I was back in Boston in the early 80s working at McLean Hospital, which is a Harvard hospital focusing on mental illness, mental disease. And Michael and I went, went to his house for dinner one night. And he, he gave me this weird looking book with a very long title um, and said, you have to read this, Clive. It's going to change your life. And I, you know, as usual, people give you books that says it's going to change your life. <clears throat> I started reading it the next day and I could not put it down. I mean, I'm a neuroscientist, I'm a neurobiologist. so. It's kind of light reading for me, but when I got to the cultural part, it was heavy, and I just really enjoyed learning about all these civilizations I didn't, didn't really know about. I had a good grasp on history, but I hadn't put together the pieces as Jane's had. And that just, just got me in, got me addicted, and fit beautifully with the work I was doing with people like Tim Crow and Floor Henry, because coincidentally, or not coincidentally, maybe I was meant to do this, we were working on the on brains of schizophrenic patients. And looking at back then, before genetics, really, in the 80s, we were looking at neurochemistry. And the question we posed was maybe in schizophrenia is caused by an imbalance of the right brain, left brain. And we addressed that by doing neurochemistry on the right amygdala. That was the area we were focused in, which is to do with mood and emotion, and comparing it to the left amygdala in patients who died of schizophrenia. So that was my research project back then in the early days. And uh, it got me very close to Floor Henry and to Tim Crow, including a visit to South America to visit the pyramids, which I'll never forget, because all these conversations came up, like how do these civilizations work all the way back then? And because I was a, a Jane's fan at that point, I, I remember pushing that idea. I don't know if it affected Tim Crow or, or not, <laughs> uh, but I know he was a proponent. So yeah, that's how I got into, into this whole area. Okay, yeah, and I know, yeah, Tim Crow's definitely mentioned James in some of his articles and has some research that's very relevant about uh, language and schizophrenia. And you also had a little bit of experience with hypnosis as well, uh, right, early in life? Yeah, so my father could hypnotize people, and he, uh, he, would, he would take 10 people at a party if he held, and he'd ask them all to stand up in front of him, and one after the other. And then he'd say, uh, you're going backwards into the darkness, backwards into the darkness, backwards into the darkness, just for a few minutes. And then they, he said, he said, now fall back, fall back. And if they fell back without any stuttering, he knew he could hypnotize them. And if they didn't, he'd, he'd push them off to the side. So I can't hypnotize you. And so he'd pick his two cases, 
put them under through that kind of trance and then do some post uh, suggestions like go up and he, he actually did it to one of my girlfriends <laughs> and uh, she didn't believe it I didn't believe it but he he got her under she went right under and then in the middle of dinner he said and he, he post he said when I say roses 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 you'll get up and water the plants so in the middle of dinner uh, he said roses 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 she got up like a machine watered the plants and sat back down didn't have a clue she just done it and it, it just really I'm like oh my god how did that work and anyway so you know following it forward it's now from James's theory very clear you know he just he just cut off executive function from coincidentally this area of the brain the prefrontal cortex and the cingulate that someone at McLean Hospital was actually working on at that time and she was showing that the neurons don't line up correct like soldiers normally all straight they're all wonky and Francine Bennis and she was running the brain bank and it's all coming together now my, and now I'm you know looking retrospectively 30 years back but it was all the pieces were all there the executive function goes in the in the uh, dominant hemisphere and you lose that control and then it switches back on again after you get out of the hypnosis and you're back so all you do with hypnosis is you turn that executive function off and now you're back to the bicameral mind and a, a very simple way of getting back so like I, every time something happened in my life with neuroscience and I've been doing this for 35 years it never has disproved James's theory it's only supported it more mm -hmm. but we're never going to prove it 100% that's going to be the challenge but the, I can't find any piece of evidence that really nails it other than people who are very upset with the fact that he came up with this idea and they didn't <laughs> yeah, exactly. And definitely the evidence has been mounting in the decades since he published his book.